Welcome back to the Football Terrace. Hit like buttons, subscribe. Make sure you have the bell notifications turned on. We're looking at Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and what he said about Man United and revealing some really painful truths about the club. We're also going to take a look at Arsenal and how they have beaten their media agenda away in so many ways. You're going to enjoy that if you're a gooner, so stay tuned. But first up, Oli and the overlap. 18 months. Mm. Yeah, 18, no, two seasons, more or less. And the summer before I got here, or here, yeah, we're in Manchester. Yes. I rang the club, said, you've got to sign this boy. He's, he'll be top, absolutely top class. That was July, June, July, 18. And they said, no, 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 they had enough reports. So, uh, OK, no problem. Then I become the temporary or a, yeah, caretaker. Then he, we'd sold him to Salzburg. I tell the club straight away, buy him straight away mm. before he's placed for it. Because he didn't play for them for three or four months. Just sign him now because he's got a release clause. Yeah. We knew that because we knew and no one else then would have paid that money. What, what kind of money would it have been? 20 million euros. So, 20 million euros Man United could have got Erling Haaland for. Not only would we have one of the best strikers in the world, one of the best young strikers in the history of football, but Manchester City wouldn't have him. And this scenario with Oli, I mean, he recommended it before he even signed. We've seen this story many times in the last decade. Club legends, scouts, whoever it may be, agents that are close to the club recommending stars. And Edward Wood and the current board, well, the old board now because they're being changed, ignoring these recommendations and doing what they wanted. As you heard there, we already have enough scouting reports. We don't need him. The lack of plan at Manchester United has been our biggest, genuinely, coupled with non-football people making football decisions, has been our, has been our biggest problem for the best part of a decade. It really has been. By the way, make sure you are following my new channel, The Squad. You can click on the link in our description, or you can also I mean, you or you can also scan that QR code on the screen now. A brand new podcast I have coming out. It's going to be one of the best in the business, one of the biggest YouTubers in the world. So go and get signed up to it now. Before, but you felt that was the summer to make the next step. I think yeah. Sancho comes in for yeah. maybe somebody else. When you buy someone so late and yeah. you're not expected, you not almost built something in pre-season and you've st sort of started the season yeah. and a vision yeah, of where your team's going to go. Yeah. Definitely. So we started off straight away. Really important, in case any of you missed that, Jamie Carragher said, you, you stated that after that Villa, Villarreal defeat, you're going into your third season, you really had to kick on. Sancho had come in, Varane had come in, Man United fans were excited about that forthcoming season. And then we signed Cristiano Ronaldo without a preseason at the last minute, and it wasn't in the plans. Wait, obviously, how are we going to press? How are we going to... Changed the little tweaks because Cristiano is different to yeah. Martial, who was up front, or if you're going to play Mason or Marcus up front. So we had to change a little bit, obviously. Uh, Cavani, so he was the one that suffered the most. Cavani, that mm. when Cristiano came in, we'd, we'd played and we'd got Edinson into a certain way of understanding our, the way we played. And it just that first game, you thought, yeah, it's going to work this because Cristiano. And obviously, Cristiano's, when you played with him, you know him, you speak to him. He wanted to play three out of four games because yeah. he realised he's getting older as well. But then when you leave him out once, yeah. he's not happy, is he? A lot of noise. Yeah. Did it change your out of possession playing him 100%. in terms of his age? Yeah. And did you have to alter all that as well? Because yeah. that's a big thing, isn't it? That was well? the biggest thing. Because yeah. with the ball, with him in the team, no problem. But without him, we had to change a little bit and different roles. And we'd, we'd gotten used to We were one of the highest pressing teams, actually, before. And we'd, we had loads of energy. Obviously, we'd, we'd left uh, Dan James go when Cristiano came in. So that's it's two different types of players. Yeah. yeah. And he isn't saying that Dan James is anywhere near as good as Cristiano. But in the modern day game, how you are out of possession is every bit as important as how you are in possession. The strengths of Arsenal right now, the strength of Pep Guardiola's Man City over the past seven to eight years has been their shape and their press and their work rate out of possession. It is what separates them from the rest, more so than their on-the-ball ability, and it's ignored too much. 
And you listen to this, this, these segments from the overlap, and it's just all that rings out to me is no planning at the club, no key football decision makers. Yes, in possession, we scored loads of goals with Cristiano Ronaldo, but there should have been somebody at the club saying, listen, Ollie, this is going to disrupt everything we've done in preseason. He doesn't fit with how we want to play outside of possession. It doesn't suit what everybody else in the team is going to do. There's going to be players that are disgruntled by this because you've told them you're planning for them this season. And the last minute, you're not just taking away their position, but you're going to change how we play. This is how clubs fail. When you go off plan, and we do it far too regularly at Manchester United, it is unfreaking believable. It's good that this has been exposed. It should be another moment where Man United fans go, right, Ineos, new owners. We want a plan. We want to stick to it. No matter who the name, no matter who the star, we have an identity that we want to stick to. As soon as you start to deviate from that identity, it all falls apart. Nice. Now I want to touch on Arsenal. I don't know why that video didn't play then. Such, just, li what, li just listen to what's being said here. Just listen. Falls to nil. Now, it's, uh, it, I, it's now down to Liverpool. City, yeah. Arsenal. Is there a ruthless momentum now building behind Arsenal in this title race? Yeah, I think there's a lot of things building behind Arsenal. Um, the emotional intelligence is a question that people ask about their exuberance and their over-celebration. They Nobody asked that question. The media said it. Rival fans jumped on it because that's kind of our job is to try and shit on our opponents, no matter how good or bad they are. But nobody cares about it in reality. They look at the season last year and wonder if the emotional intelligence contributed or lack of emotional intelligence contributed to them ultimately choking. Nothing to do with celebrating, handling the pressure of leading the league. Absolutely. But just drop the celebrating nonsense. At certain times in the course of the season, but going to where they are now, I think that the, the, the result that stands out for me is not smashing a hapless Burnley or a useless Sheffield United or out of sorts Crystal Palace is what they did to Newcastle. Put aside the game against Porto because they'll write that wrong in the second um, in the second uh, leg yeah. of the of the tie against Porto at the Emirates. But the manner in which they destroyed Newcastle and made Newcastle look like they weren't even in the game because of the dynamic. I think you've also got to include the Liverpool game in that as well. By the way, they were class in that. The ruthlessness, the overall. Um, proficiency of everything Arsenal were doing in that burst of period of time in that game where they destroyed Newcastle showed me something. Now, the interesting thing for Arsenal is that if the results go their way this weekend, let's say the two guys at the top cancel themselves out with a draw and Arsenal do to Brentford, which I expect them to do, Arsenal go into a three-week Premier League break in terms of fixtures, top of the league. And I think if they go top of the league, yeah, I think they could win the league. There you go. Now, that's a big statement. That's a big, big statement from Simon Jordan. And I said a few weeks ago on Straight Facts with Savar and Mo that I felt Arsenal had a, with hindsight, <laughs> they had a better chance this year of winning the league compared to last year. They couldn't handle the pressure of being the, the front runners from so early on last season. Kind of going under the radar a little bit, being seen as third favourites, I think has suited them. They're playing amazing football. They're hard to break down. They can't stop scoring goals. But I think it's highly significant that someone like Simon Jordan is changing his mind. It shows that Arsenal have beaten him. It shows that he is now dropping, to a large degree, his bias, his hatred, his frustration with Arsenal. Just to show you what I mean, here's some snippets of Simon Jordan from the last few years when talking about Arsenal. It's interesting, Simon. I mean, if Arsenal want Ben White, and let's face it, why would he want to go there? 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 Want to go there? I think they need a 25 goal a season striker. I'm not sure that Arteta has been given anything other than a reset and the expectation of Arsenal. I don't know what Arsenal are. I don't know what Arsenal are. And if he wants to be successful, he's going to need players that have got the chops to be able to compete with those that have. Arsenal won't win the league this year. That we're really looking at seeing if Man City decline, that's the opportunity rather than necessarily the other sides get better. I think Arteta is the beneficiary of an erosion of Arsenal's expectations. I don't know what Arsenal are. Arsenal won't win the league this year now. Arsenal won't win the league. So you can see from writing them off this season to win the league, going right back to signing Ben White, why would Ben White go there? Simon Jordan has been a detractor of Arsenal for a long time. I felt that a lot of a lot of media pundits now and a lot of sort of personalities in this game, when they give an opinion and their opinion starts to look wrong, they go through this denial curve period of digging their heels in, 
looking for any which way to try and prove they were right. But it's interesting to see Simon Jordan now looking at this from the other side of the fence and recognizing Arsenal for what they are, a genuinely, genuinely top, top team. Do your math, right? Sort your maths out. Hold on, hold on! Sort your maths out. Hold on! I mean, you can't spell, we can't do maths, honestly. On, right, in second percentage spot. Second. Liverpool. Yeah. 35%. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Man City the rest, whatever that is. (laughs) (laughs) So Man City is still favourites. 51%. That's the be- that's the that's the statistics probability percentages Logan. So fifty one percent on 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 City, thirty five percent to Liverpool, meaning twenty four percent chance. So they are the underdogs according to the bookmakers and according to these two here on Talksport. Talk you know Sport. That's Arsenal. That is. What do you think of that? Breaking news. Yeah. Okay. You know what? I'm I'm happy with that because look, we fly under the radar, we nick it in the last few games, and and you know what? Do you think you're, you're flying you're under the radar? Right. I think we are flying oh, under yeah. the radar. I, I, mean, I don't know if you are, yeah. mate. I mean, you've, still- you've got to be flying under the radar if you're the third favourites out of the three. Nobody has predicted you to win the league. And still, it, Simon Jordan's changed his tune based on this weekend's games. But most people still don't think you're going to win it. So, of course, when it comes to are you winning the league conversations, you're flying slightly under the radar. 30 we goals in the last five games. What radar? Well, we're third, aren't we? So you can't really say that we're going to bottle it in when it when it comes. Oh, down you're worried about being called a bottle job now? Oh, come on, no, you, no, 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 because you guys, yeah. right? Talk yeah. for you guys. Yeah. Always, you always have this narrative of Arsenal who's you? When you say you, listen. When you, you're talking to Logan, a Spurs we all, fan over we all there, know right? What's going to happen? <laughs> then, right, 27th of April, you're going to play Tottenham at the Spurs Stadium. You're going to be right in the mix, and you're going to turn up there. Apple crumble, bottoms are going to fall out. Okay. Spurs win, three one. Thanks for coming. Title's over. Right. Okay. <laughs> Listen, every Spurs fan will want that, and I understand it. You're playing with the football gods a little bit there, O'Hara. You're playing with them football gods a little bit when you say that. But do you know what I realised? Some rivals that are still angry, that are still hating on Arsenal, that still can't accept they're a very good team now, is this notion of, we called them bottle jobs last year because they were leading. They don't win it from this position. We can't call them bottle jobs because they weren't up at the top. What do we call it? And they're struggling. They're absolutely struggling. So it's such an interesting contrast. You're never going to get Jamie O'Hara on board. He's a Spurs man through and through. And I respect that 110%. But I would say this as well to Gooners. Life without a little bit of hate would be a little bit boring for you. But the copium, the hopium, and everything going through these rivals of Arsenal right now is crazy. And I do hope one day, one day, I pray that this shamelessness happens regarding my club, Man United. I I genuinely do. I'm I'm a bit jealous of it. I'm not going to lie. Until next time, take care. Goodbye. God bless. And I'll see you all again soon.